So with this lecture, we pick up uh, kind of where we left off with the Roman Empire. And this is coming into a period of decline, but it's going to be a very long, drawn-out decline. And really, when we talk about the eventual collapse of the Roman Empire, uh, we're really thinking of the Western half. At some point, the empire becomes divided into two components, East and West. And the Eastern part will eventually evolve into something quite different, the Byzantine Empire, which will carry on for many centuries. So a good point for, uh, to start would be with the Emperor Diocletian who reigned between 284 and 305. And he is the one who is going to initiate this kind of division of the empire into an east and west uh, as part of a new administrative structure for the empire. So he became emperor following the uh, murder of his predecessor, Numerian. Uh, and at this point, the emperor had uh, empire had become quite unwieldy, very difficult to govern, confronted with many problems internally and externally. Uh, but increasingly, the main threat to the empire was perceived as being to the east, a newly uh, arisen Persian empire. Uh, so among other things, the focus of attention of the government is increasingly going to be to the east. Uh, and, and that's something that's going to become very important with uh, subsequent emperors. Starting with Diocletian, though, we have this idea of dividing the empire into two halves, which each, each half kind of being governed separately from the other. Right. And uh, this administrative structure will actually involve further divisions. Each half will be divided into two prefectures, meaning you'll have four in total. And then each prefecture will be divided into three dioceses for 12 in total. Uh, and so there will be a certain degree of autonomy at each level. The diocese, each will be headed by a vicar. And by the way, the terminology there might seem familiar, particularly if you were raised Catholic. Uh, that kind of administrative uh, terminology is going to be adopted later on by the Catholic Church, right, where a diocese will represent the jurisdiction of a particular bishop. In any event, right, this map gives you a pretty good idea of how things break down in terms of, you know, this kind of eastern, uh, western division, and then each half being divided into a prefecture. And again, each one to some degree being govern, uh, governed independently. So we refer to this administrative structure as a tetrarchy system. Tetra literally meaning four in this case, the, the idea that it's divided into four components, which e each half would have been ruled by an Augustus. And then each Augustus would have been assisted by a chief lieutenant or vice emperor, if you will, called a Caesar, right? So the Augustus would have overriding authority with respect to the entire uh, half of the empire for which he was responsible, uh, but then would have been more uh, directly in control of one of the uh, prefixtures and his Caesar, his assistant uh, or you know, chief lieutenant would have been responsible for the, for the other prefixture, right? So each of the four tetrarchs, you have two Augusti and two Caesars, uh, and, and altogether you effectively have four administrative capitals, right? Of which Rome would have been the most prominent. Uh, though, again, kind of indicative of the fact that there is uh, greater concern for developments to the east, Diocletian, who would have had ultimate authority, uh, would have been responsible for the eastern half, uh, with a strong military commander named Maximian being responsible for the western half, right? But again, supreme power residing with Diocletian. The other important development during this period is going to be that power is increasingly going to reside solely with the emperor. Uh, and of course, you know, emperors for quite a while now have been the ultimate authority in the empire, but to some extent they had continued to govern with the Senate in a somewhat kind of informal arrangement. You could say the Senate uh, acted as a kind of advisory body. Being a member of the Senate basically uh, indicated that you were part of the political elite. And while the emperor was not required to take their advice, uh, you know, usually he would... Uh, would respect what they had to say and maybe in some cases even defer to their collective wisdom. Uh, but that's going to change, particularly under Constantine. So Constantine is going to reign from 306 to 337, uh, originally kind of maintaining this division into an eastern and western half. Uh, he would be in control uh, of the west uh, starting in 312. Uh, and initially kind of sharing power with a fellow named Licinius, but in 324, uh, by that point, they had basically uh, come into conflict with one another, seeking to be, you know, kind of the sole ruler of the empire, and he would emerge victorious in 324. 
Uh, I should note, this is kind of a temporary respite in terms of the, this kind of growing division between the Western and Eastern halves. Uh, and eventually that will become permanent because in large measure, it really does reflect that, uh, you know, other kinds of changes are really pulling them apart, uh, regardless of what any one ruler might intend. In any event, it's under Constantine that the, uh, the, the power and authority of the emperor is going to become complete, right? Uh, so, you know, Diocletian had kind of initiated this kind of change. He had very uh, kind of autocratic uh, dictatorial approach to governing, but this is something that Constantine is going to greatly expand. So first of all, uh, some of this is going to be reflected in how the emperor presents himself, right? So as a way of kind of signifying that uh, he has greater personal power than previously, the emperor will always appear in this very kind of ostentatious costume. Right, kind of uh, indicative of this idea that he rules by, uh, by divine will. And that becomes especially relevant as Christianity becomes more prominent in the empire, something we're going to look at shortly, right? So very often appearing in jewel bedecked robes of gold and blue, right? And the idea that the emperor somehow reflects God's will on earth, uh, you know, someone uh, that has awesome might, someone that's very remote from common people. Uh, the Roman Senate is going to be stripped of any real power. So it continues to exist, but effectively becoming little more than a municipal council responsible only to the city of Rome. And as we're going to see, Rome becoming increasingly less important to the empire as a whole. Uh, in as much as the emperor is now ruling directly, we're going to see uh, an expansion of the bureaucracies, right? Bureaucracies made up of individuals who work uh, for the government, basically who carry out the will of the emperor. And uh, so it's really going to break down into two components. Uh, you have a civil bureaucracy responsible for governing the empire for all matters internal to the empire, and then a military bureaucracy responsible for foreign affairs, for the military, and so forth. And one's rank in the bureaucracy basically signifies one's status, uh, and one's closeness to the emperor. So you have new titles of nobility that pretty much signify this, that you are either an illustre, meaning illustrious one, or illustrissimi, uh, the most illustrious ones, right? Which would signify that you have a much higher position, uh, higher rank in the hierarchy, and that you are in, in that sense much closer to the emperor. In the meantime, the army is going to be enlarged, which among other things also secures the position of the emperor. Uh, the army is enlarged to four, 400,000 men. Uh, this is also about securing the borders. Problematic here is that increasingly the army is becoming dependent on foreigners, on Germans who are, you know, in the past Germans had, so you have these German tribes that are now migrating into Europe, and we'll get to that momentarily. Uh, and that had been going on for a while, but they're starting to uh, really come into Europe in much larger numbers, forcibly displacing whoever came before them, pushing them over the borders into Germany. Uh, in the past, Germans would have entered the empire in smaller numbers, would have been Romanized, and then eventually might become part of the Roman Empire. Now they're actually coming in in large numbers where entire tribes are inducted into the army. Uh, but the problem with that is they tend not to be Romanized, right? Since they're coming in in large groups, uh, they tend to maintain uh, a sense of their own distinct identity uh, as being something other than Roman, which also means that they're less likely to be loyal to the Roman Empire. And in fact, at this point, the Roman Empire is confronted with many problems, uh, many of which at their base are economic. Uh, a major problem is a lack of revenue. So especially if you're expanding your bureaucracies, also the army, you need to pay these people, right? Bureaucracies are made up of people who work in the administration uh, and you need to pay your soldiers, particularly if they are Germans uh, who really are not particularly loyal to the empire. The problem is the population isn't growing. And you have, that means you have a very limited tax base because, uh, you know, normally you would count on having a growing population. More people are paying the same amount of tax. Now you need to tax the, a smaller number of people more than prior. And at some point you hit a wall where people haven't anything left to give. It's creating resentments. Uh, another problem uh, economic in nature is inflation, right? So one way to deal with not having enough revenue 
is to actually create more currency in this case debasing your coins right so uh, using smaller amounts of gold and silver uh, in your coins so you can spread it out over more coins this would be the equivalent of say today printing money the problem with that uh, as some of you probably know, if you print more money, then the value of each dollar actually is less. So you need more of them to get the same goods. Uh, and so, you know, that is going to create a problem of inflation, uh, which Diocletian is going to try to deal with effectively by decree, for instance, establishing maximum wages, right? So that, you know, if you have inflation, uh, what normally would happen is wages should go up, right? So that you need more money. Uh, to achieve the same value, whether in terms of uh, what you're being paid for your labor or buying goods. Uh, and this is going to prove unenforceable. I mean, it's really something he can decree, but he can't really make it happen. Uh, of course, the initial problem of uh, you know, expanding your currency is going to be aggravated further by Constantine introducing a new gold coin that has less gold in it, the Solidus, also new silver coins. Uh, and then at some point, you're going to have a problem where it's really unprofitable for people to work in the administration, particularly at the more local level, for instance, as city councilors or curiales uh, in the smaller towns, uh, in you know, some of the smaller cities. Uh, and so at some point, Diocletian and Constantine are both going to issue edicts forcing the rich to continue to serve in these positions, regardless of the fact that they're not profitable. Uh, a big part of the problem is they are responsible for, pay, uh, for collecting taxes, and very often they are set quotas, which if they cannot meet, if they cannot collect the ordained amount of tax for which they are responsible, they have to make up the difference out of their own pockets. Right. So, I mean, obviously, th this is a major disincentive to serving in that position. And then you're going to have a problem of a shortage of labor. And again, they're going to issue edicts, you know, basically decrees demanding that people stay within certain positions, uh, also making certain vocations, you know, like, let's say, shoemaker uh, or iron, uh, you know, someone responsible for making weapons that it becomes hereditary. Right. So your son has to actually hold the same position. Uh, and again, a lot of this very difficult to enforce and certainly not making you popular. And in some ways related to this, uh, if we think about agricultural work, we see the beginnings of feudalism, right, starting to be laid down. Uh, so first of all, large landowners are going to take advantage of depressed agricultural conditions, right, to buy out small farmers who basically uh, are going to go out of business. And so you're going to get a smaller number of very large landed estates, uh, which means you also have many farmers who have who don't have any land. Right. So they end up becoming tenant farmers working on these large landed estates uh, known as they are known as colony. Uh, and, you know, also you're going to see kind of a breakdown in security, kind of a breakdown in trade uh, as various communities become isolated from one another. Right. Meaning that the uh, spaces in between become uh, you know, very insecure, subject to uh, banditry uh, and, you know, other kinds of problems later on, kind of rampaging German soldiers and so forth who haven't been paid. Uh, so they end up kind of staying on these large landed estates and become dependent on large landowners. And some of you, some of you probably know that the essence of feudalism uh, is that you have peasants who end up becoming tied to the land tied to large land uh, landed estates and so that's kind of starting to happen here uh, and really you know also there's the problem again of an inadequate supply of labor uh, so again the emperors are issuing edicts basically forcing the colony to stay on whatever landed estate they they are located right to ensure that there is a food supply uh, for the empire right so all of this kind of you know kind of laying part of the groundwork for feudalism, which will become kind of a dominant uh, element of medieval society when we get to the Middle Ages. Now, probably the thing that Constantine is most famous for is building a new capital for the Roman Empire. So between 324 and 330, Constantine will construct a new capital on the site of an already existing rather smallish Greek city known as Byzantium, uh, whence comes the name uh, Byzantine, as in Byzantine Empire. Uh, that won't be adopted until later. Uh, why does he choose that location? Well, first of all, 
uh, it is much closer to the eastern frontier. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a kind of a growing perception that the center of gravity in the empire is in the east, that the major, the most important threat confronting the, confronting the empire is the Persian empire, right? So therefore, you don't want to be right on the frontier uh, where you would be vulnerable, but you do want to be close enough where you can find out what's going on there relatively quickly. You can relay orders to the frontier very quickly. Uh, and get your army there very quickly, right? So Constant, uh, Constantinople, uh, the name of this new city, uh, obviously named after Constantine, will be built further east. Uh, it is also uh, built on a site easy to defend, right? It's a uh, piece of territory that is surrounded by water on three sides. They'll build these very formidable defensive walls. Uh, uh, it's only accessible by land from one side, but you know that that's better than being accessible from all sides. So it is actually pretty easy to defend. Uh, and later on, actually, Constantinople will become very famous uh, for how difficult it is to actually try and take the city, particularly after they build these really, really impressive defensive walls. Now, none of this means that Constantine has completely abandoned Rome, still considered a very important city, something uh, evident in the fact that you're going to see a lot of important construction taking place there. Uh, some of it uh, of a kind of more monumental nature. For instance, Constantine will build a triumphal arch between 312 and 315. You can see it in this image located very near the Colosseum, uh, but also building lots of public baths, uh, new churches for the Christian faith in Rome. Uh, we're going to learn more about that in a bit, but Constantine is going to do a lot to promote the Christian faith. Uh, and also one of them will be uh, the first basilica dedicated to St. Peter. So kind of laying the foundation for what will become the Vatican. Uh, and certainly uh, he is going to do a lot to strengthen the position of Christian leaders in Rome. So though, you know, though Rome will no longer be the capital of the Roman Empire, will become less important with respect to Roman affairs, will become very important uh, with respect to a kind of uh, what will soon be a, a rapidly emerging Catholic Church. And so what's going on with that, right? Uh, also very famously, Constantine is going to convert to Christianity, uh, though some of you might be surprised to learn that he doesn't officially become a Christian uh, until shortly before his death, right? But even before that, uh, you know, at some point, uh, he began to view the Christian faith very favorably. Uh, according to legend, uh, and you know, there might be some truth to this, Constantine had a vision before an important battle where he saw a cross in the sky, right? He, he, he took this as, uh, you know, kind of uh, an indicator uh, of the validity of the faith, particularly after he won the battle, right? This happened in 312. And so uh, to be very clear, he is not going to make Christianity somehow the official uh, religion of the empire. Uh, but he is going to make it acceptable to be a Christian in the empire in 313 with the Edict of Milan, which officially tolerates the existence of Christianity, uh, something which wasn't the case prior to that. Uh, and uh, the problem up until then had been that uh, many Christians, because of their faith, were unwilling to also engage in pagan worship. Uh, in the Roman Empire, it was perfectly acceptable to follow whatever religion you wanted, so long as you also participated uh, in certain pagan rituals, uh, which would have been a way of kind of indicating your loyalty to the Roman Empire, right? Many Christians uh, and also many Jews had refused to do this, but this became like a major issue for Christians, uh, and this had led to their persecution, right? That officially comes to an end in 313. But Constantine himself will not be baptized until just before his death. Now, we should note he's going to do many other things to promote the Christian faith within the empire. Uh, so, for instance, building uh, churches, including laying the foundation for what will eventually become the Basilica of St. Peter, uh, the residency of the Pope down the road. Uh, so, I mean, that's obviously very important, but he's going to also be building churches in the quote-unquote Holy Land. Uh, he becomes very much interested in learning about various traditions that uh, had emerged by this point concerning the life of Jesus. Uh, and so then uh, eventually building churches uh, on the sites uh, 
of important events in the life of Jesus, probably the most important of which would have been the site of his crucifixion uh, and his resurrection. Uh, and that would become the site of what, uh, and, and the image you see there is actually the present day uh, version of it, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Sepulchre actually means tomb, right? So it is effectively the Church of the Tomb of Jesus. Uh, so the site where he was buried, but also located within the confines of that structure, uh, is a small hill upon which, by this point, tradition maintained Jesus had been crucified. Uh, and so, as you might imagine, this is, even until today, a very important site of pilgrimage uh, for many Christians, right? But the first Church of the Holy Sepulchre was initiated by uh, Constantine, uh, in a sense, through his mother, who would, would eventually be canonized, St. Elena, uh, who supposedly went to the Holy Land to locate uh, the exact, you know, to determine the exact location of these important events in the life of Jesus. Uh, one interesting story about, you know, so they, they wanted to confirm that this was, in fact, the site where Jesus had been crucified and also to confirm uh, which of the many crosses they found there. Uh, and they, they found them in a cistern, a kind of well that's been kind of chiseled into the ground, into the stone. Uh, they found a large number of crosses there, right? So they were pretty sure they had the right location. Uh, also kind of an indication that some people had been buried there, right? But then they wanted to confirm, uh, you know, that this was in fact where Jesus was crucified. Also, uh, at some point, which of these crosses was in fact the quote-unquote true cross? Uh, so the tradition told now, uh, for instance, if you were to vi visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, is that in order to figure out which cross had belonged to Jesus, what they did is uh, they went and found a dead body, laid it out, and then laid each cross next to him. And they knew that they had the right cross when the body came back to life. Uh, so true story. No, true story. True legend. I didn't make it up. Uh, but, you know, it's a question of faith whether you, you believe that. By the way, if you do visit the tomb of Jesus, located very close to the place where he was supposedly crucified, uh, you can go inside, but of course, do not expect to find the body of Jesus uh, because, you know, Christ is risen, right? According to Christian tradition, three days after his burial, uh, he rose from the dead, right? And so the, the resurrection, kind of an indication of his divinity uh, and the fact that he had died for our sins, right? Which is kind of a central tenet of the Christian faith. One last thing, by the way, the structure you see there, very little of it actually dates back to the original structure, uh, in large measure because it would be destroyed and rebuilt a number of times. Much of what you see there actually dating uh, back to the time of the Crusades. And of course, just in case you weren't sure, that is located in the city of Jerusalem. Now, one other church that St. Elena will kind of get started, uh, she will locate uh, the site where supposedly Jesus was born. Uh, and that will become the site for the Church of the Nativity which you see here, that is in fact pretty much the original structure dating back to, you know, when it was, was initially built during the uh, time of Constantine. Uh, so by the way, of course, the Church of the Nativity is not located in Jerusalem, but about 20 minutes down the road in a small village or pretty sizable town now known as Bethlehem. So Constantine isn't actually going to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That'll happen a little bit down the road uh, after paganism kind of gets a, a uh, kind of one last hurrah uh, in between Constantine and then eventually the guy who does make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, Theodosius the Great, uh, who reigns between 378 and 395. Uh, and from that point forward, uh, now it's going to be pagans who are persecuted, right? So Christian leaders are going to use their growing influence to effectively outlaw pagan religious practices, uh, will, which will eventually peter out. So by the fourth century, right, Christianity uh, is becoming the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. Uh, and it's also becoming highly organized, right? Uh, so, for instance, it's going to become very hierarchical uh, in its governmental structure, where you're going to have a kind of pyramidal structure where you have uh, at the very top some very important bishops, uh, very often referred to as archbishops, below them just regular bishops, and then 
you know, kind of further divisions uh, working your way down, right? And they're going to borrow a system of government very much based on the territorial plan of Roman administration, right? So again, we're going to see the term uh, diocese, uh, though that corresponds to something we might also call it a bishopric, because each diocese is headed up by a bishop, right? And usually the bishop's seat of authority would be in the most important city within that diocese or bishopric, right? And then these bishoprics will be gathered together into provinces that are under the direction of archbishops. And at the very top are the four most important bishops or archbishops uh, who are based in the cities of Rome, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Antioch. Antioch, which is located in what today is Syria, uh, Alexandria in modern day Egypt, right? And the idea was that these cities are especially important because uh, their bishoprics were actually founded by the original, original apostles of Jesus. And therefore they were held, uh, considered to hold special positions of power. And of course, you know, most famous is perhaps in this vein would be Rome, uh, where the bishopric was supposedly founded by Peter. Right, hence why the basilica there is referred to as St. Peter. Now, one major concern of, of the church, and when I say church, I mean the collective body of, Christ, of Christendom or Christianity up until this point. Uh, and there is only one Christian community at this point, right? Eventually, you know, down the road, it will start to divide into various sects. Uh, probably today, the three most important divisions within Christianity, you have the Catholic Church, uh, you have uh, the Orthodox Church, which tends to be uh, dominant in countries like Russia, Greece, much of East Europe. And then, of course, you have Protestant sects, which actually could be further divided into a, uh, a large number of uh, semi-independent churches, right, that actually operate apart from one another. Uh, you know, back at the point we're looking at now, fourth century, you really have only the one uh, united church or, or universal church. Uh, the word for universal is Catholic, hence where we get the term Catholic church. So you could say really at this point, there is only the Catholic church. And the primary concern of, of the church at this point is to ensure that everyone has proper belief, right? They're still kind of working out, well, what is it exactly that Christians believe? What constitutes official belief? Uh, and the way this concern uh, mostly uh, manifests itself is in trying to eradicate wrong belief uh, or heresies, right? So the best definition for heresy would be wrong belief, right? That you believe something that is considered to be uh, incorrect uh, and very often considered to be dangerous, right? I mean, so usually they're concerned about what are the most important beliefs that define who we are as Christians. And by the way, all religions go through this, right? During the early stages, trying to work out, you know, usually there are different ideas floating around uh, about what it is we believe, you know, what is, what is in this case, what is the nature of Jesus? Is he God? Is he man? Uh, what's his relationship to God the Father and so forth? And so, you know, there are different points of view that are floating around. At some point, kind of a consensus emerges about which beliefs are correct. Uh, and that very often ends up constituting uh, what might be called canon, right? Canon meaning what is considered to be acceptable belief, what is the correct belief. Uh, and other beliefs are deemed heresies and therefore need to be eradicated. Uh, now, having said that, uh, some of this also reflects politics, right? So it could be that the views held by, uh, you know, that are held in Constantinople are deemed more uh, important to the emperor uh, than views that are held in, say, Alexandria, right? And therefore, as a way of kind of assuring uh, the legitimacy of his rule uh, becomes important or even imperative that everyone has proper belief and look to the emperor, look to the church based in, say, Constantinople, later on, say, in Rome, uh, to know what it is they should believe, what, and also what constitutes correct practice, right? So again, kind of, you know, making a long story short, early history of the church very much concerned with defining what constitutes correct belief. And early on, there are two heresies that become very prominent uh, that the church feels need to be stamped out. One is promoted by a priest in North Africa named Donatus, and hence the heresy is often referred to as Donatism. 
And so he taught that the sacraments, right, there are certain rituals that are considered to have a sacred quality. And we already uh, were introduced to what might be one of the most important ones, uh, the Eucharist, right? This kind of idea that, you know, during the mass, during the church service, uh, when you take uh, a small piece of bread, you take a, a sip from the wine, that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Christ and that therefore you are experiencing a kind of communion with Jesus, with the, divi with the divine, right? With divinity. Uh, and, you know, so Donatus argued that the sacraments are not valid, right? That this kind of holy quality that they have, uh, you know, it doesn't take place if they are administered by an immoral priest. Uh, you know, so if the priest who is actually carrying out the sacrament of, say, the Eucharist, uh, in some ways equally or, or maybe even more important would be baptism, right? Baptism is the point of entry into the Christian faith, right? Where usually, you, you know, this idea that you're dunked into the water, you bring in, uh, you bring the Holy Spirit into yourself, you know, kind of manifestation of God. And in this way, you become uh, connected to Jesus, right? Into his saving grace, uh, and until you do this, you're not effectively a Christian, right? So imagine if you told someone that, well, you know, that baptism you had back in the day when you were much younger, uh, we found out that the priest that administered it had, had done some things he shouldn't, right? Maybe had, you know, fornicated or in any event had behaved in an immoral way. Therefore, your baptism is illegitimate. So, you know, it's not too hard to follow the logic, you know, why, you know, one might argue the sacrament uh, carried out by an immoral priest is not legitimate. Uh, at the same time, though, you can see where this would create a lot of anxiety uh, and is not very practical. So eventually the church is going to stamp that one out. That doesn't actually prove to be too difficult. More difficult is going to be the heresy of Arianism, initiated by a priest from Alexandria in Egypt named Arius, who argued that Jesus was human and thus not truly God. And by this point, probably the prevailing view, and it hadn't been made totally official yet, but the prevailing view was that Jesus was both God and man. Uh, and you know, they, they hadn't quite worked out what that actually meant. You know, how can you be both things? Uh, but there were also some people who were promoting the view that uh, he is either holy God, and in the case of Arius, that he is holy human, that he is not God at all. Uh, and in this, he would be opposed by a bishop in Alexandria, Athanasius, who argued that Jesus was both human and God. And so this became a major issue of debate uh, within the Roman Empire, particularly in the East. Uh, and eventually it got back to Constantine, right? And he saw this as something that really would prove divisive to the church uh, and would undermine, uh, you know, and already he's kind of aware that he can use the church as a way to legitimize his rule. Right. But it becomes essential that we define what is correct belief. Right. And then, you know, therefore, uh, not just the archbishop in Constantinople, but also Constantine, the emperor, uh, in a sense, uh, become the, shall you say, the guardians of truth in that regard. Now, some of this is actually political. Uh, be, you know, Arius enjoyed tremendous support among uh, much of the population in Egypt. They saw this as a way of kind of separating themselves from Constantinople. Uh, but in any event, at some point it was decided we need to kind of, you know, work out what is proper belief uh, at the top level. And that will lead to the Council of Nicaea, uh, one of the most important gatherings of, of the uh, leaders of the church in the history of Christianity in 325. The council is convened by Constantine, who was very, again, very disturbed by the controversy surrounding Arius's claim. Uh, and so the council is going to come together, right, all the uh, important leaders of the Christian church throughout the empire to kind of thrash this out. And in the end, they condemn Arianism and state. Uh, and so now it becomes official that Jesus is both God and man. Uh, the question is, how is that possible? And then, you know, the issue becomes, how do you maintain monotheism, right? The idea that there is one God, but now you're talking about like two different manifestations of God. You know, and by the way, there's already the idea of, you know, that there's something called the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, kind of a third element, right? What we call the Holy Trinity, right? So, you know, there's this kind of, kind of inconsistency there. 
Uh, and so they're, they're going to actually try to come up with a formula that allows for, you know, having the Holy Trinity, certainly allowing for the idea that Jesus is both man and God, but also maintains the oneness of God. And that formula will be the Nicene Creed, right, which is very often, even until now, uh, periodically recited in the church during the service, right? It's basically a statement of official Christian belief. We believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, right? So there is the one God, the Father. But we also believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. So already, you know, well, how do we reconcile that with the oneness of God? Well, here's how we do it, right? The only begotten Son of God. Uh, they use the word begotten, and the, the actual Greek term would be even more complex in this regard, right? But they don't want to use the word created. To say that Jesus was created, right? That, you know, before his birth, he didn't exist. And then at the moment of his birth, he came into existence, right? Was created in that moment really would imply that he is something distinct from the Father and therefore uh, very disruptive of monotheism, right? So they use the term begotten, and then they explain, begotten of the Father before all worlds, eons, like light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And, you know, they're really stressing this idea that, you know, Jesus is co-eternal. Jesus was never created. Jesus always existed just like God. There is no beginning, there is no end, and he is of the same substance of God. He is one with God, and he is also, yes, in a sense, distinct, right? That he is also man is basically the idea of God manifesting himself in this reality in a moment in time, right? In essence, a miracle. And we kind of talked about this when we looked at uh, the beginnings of monotheism with Judaism, right? How to explain God acting in the world. Uh, and I should note, just by way of, of rounding up this discussion, uh, a lot of Christian theology in trying to understand, you know, that God is both, you know, somehow one, uh, one in the sense that he is indivisible, you, you cannot like kind of break him down into components, which is problematic if you talk about God acting in moments in time, acting within this physical realm. Uh, but he also does exist in this physical realm in moments in time, right? So they, they're going to borrow a tremendous amount from Plato and his ideas about ideal forms, right? Where God is kind of the ideal form. Jesus is this kind of material manifestation of that ideal form uh, in this reality. And by the way, that is a gross simplification of it. Uh, but one last thing, the, if you've seen the movie The Matrix, a lot of the ideas in The Matrix, uh, especially concerning the character Neo, uh, very much rooted in Christian theology along these lines. Well, in any event, uh, we're going to pause right there as far as our discussion of the evolution of the church, come back to more political developments. Uh, suffice it to say, by 395, the empire is permanently divided into an east and a west. The east will continue to thrive eventually as the Byzantine Empire, and in fact will carry on until 1453. That's quite a long time. The West will eventually succumb to Germanic tribes, right? And as this map illustrates, you have this kind of uh, periodically recurring uh, development of Germanic tribes migrating from the East, right? Settling in parts of Europe, initially able to coexist with the Roman Empire, you know, maybe small numbers entering the Empire, but then new Germanic tribes coming in from the East, putting pressure on those who are already there, who then end up getting pushed into the Roman Empire. Uh, in larger numbers, and it becomes very difficult for the empire to absorb them. Uh, and this is a major factor, right? At some point, you have Germanic tribes wandering around different parts of the Roman Empire, very difficult to contain, even in some cases threatening Rome itself, as when Attila the Hun brought his army, uh, his tribe, right up to the gates of Rome, uh, eventually was turned back by the Archbishop of Rome, by this time being referred to as the Pope. Uh, which kind of signifies a kind of uh, emerging idea that the Archbishop of Rome has ultimate authority over the church, uh, Gregory the Great. This also kind of reflects the fact that the church is becoming much more uh, important politically 
in Rome as Roman authority disintegrates in that city, right? So the church kind of filling that vacuum. So we might look at some of these different Germanic tribes that are beginning to arrive into the Roman Empire, eventually settling in different parts of the Roman Empire. Uh, and and they, in many ways, very distinct from one another, though they, they have many of the same cultural elements. Uh, certainly, they all speak variations of a, you know, some kind of Germanic language. Uh, you know, by the way, I mean, what today uh, it constitutes formal German is in many ways a very modern invention going back roughly to the uh, early 16th century. Uh, so back then, many different forms of German. Uh, one early one to em uh, enter the empire would be the Visigoths. Um, so initially, the Romans tried to kind of negotiate a modus vivendi, a way to, to kind of get along. Uh, they allowed the Visigoths to farm uh, areas in the Balkans, what is Southeast Europe today, in return for providing troops to the Romans. Uh, but at some point, the Romans started mistreating them, and they eventually revolted. Uh, in 378, the emperor at the time, Valens, confronted the Visigoths with an army of 40,000 men. Didn't go too well, right? Emperor himself was killed, and two-thirds of the Roman army were wiped out. Uh, so definitely not a good sign. Uh, and, and you know certainly a clear indication of the weakness of the Roman Empire, also the weakness of the emperor. Uh, emperors are supposed to be you know these uh, invincible individuals. So you know from a propaganda point of view, that was not a good thing. So the Visigoths, after defeating the Romans, uh, would eventually be resettled by the new emperor Theodosius the first. And again, they're going to try and incorporate them into the Roman army. Uh, the problem here is right when you're when you absorb them into the Roman army in small numbers, they very quickly, you can kind of disperse them uh, throughout the various legions. They end up becoming assimilated, Romanized. Uh, in this case, entire Germanic tribes are being brought in and they end up constituting distinct units known as ferrates, uh, meaning allies of Rome. But the problem is, as long as they uh, remain distinct in this way, Right? They're not really able to develop any feeling of connectedness with the Roman Empire. Uh, and so, you know, really, they're, they're going to be looking out for their own interests, right? If it's in their interest to remain loyal to the Roman Empire, to fight on behalf of Rome, great. On the other hand, uh, if it would seem clear to them that uh, going against Rome is in their interest, you've got a problem. Uh, and so at some point, they're going to prove a threat to Rome. Right. So under a fellow named Alaric, for instance, they're actually going to sack the city of Rome in 410 uh, because they had been refused uh, to, to be allowed to settle in parts of northern Italy. Uh, I mean, they basically wanted to take control of it, make it their own. Rome said no. And they said, OK, uh, we're, we're going to go after you. Uh, by the way, if you don't know what the term sacking means, it's basically, you know, you enter the city uh, and then engage in raping and pillaging and things of that nature. Right. So. You're not there to conquer it, just to enrich yourself and uh, exploit it temporarily, uh, very often in a quite ugly way, but then you leave. Uh, and so here we see the sacking of Rome in 410. Uh, meanwhile, Germanic tribes are moving into various parts of the Roman Empire in the West. And see, at some point you have this kind of pattern, right? Like they move into an area. Uh, at some point they become dominant. They even settle down there. Roman forces eventually withdrawn. And, you know, so the Western Roman Empire just keeps shrinking and shrinking uh, until it's really a small amount of territory around the city of Rome and even Rome clearly not safe. And then finally, eventually coming to an end. And so, you know, it's kind of hard to set a date for the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, most historians go with the year 476, right? So at some point, uh, you know, really the Roman Empire is nothing more than the northern part of Italy a small part of Gaul, roughly what corresponds to France today, but just a small part of it, as by the mid fifth century. Uh, at some point, emperors don't even have any real power. Real power lies with military officials known as masters of the soldiers. And then finally, in 476, one of these, a fellow named Odasser, deposes the last Roman emperor in Rome. And that's generally considered as marking the final absolute end of imperial authority in the West. And so by 500, this is, you know, pretty much what we've got. Uh, what had been the Western Roman Empire has been replaced by Germanic kingdoms, uh, whereas the Eastern Empire, 
uh, you know, is going to continue to thrive, but it's really evolving into something quite different, right? Even though it's still sometimes referred to as Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, and by the way, in some languages, for instance, uh, when we look at developments in the Middle East connected with Islam, uh, for a long time, the Arabs, in Arabic, they referred to them as Rum, as in Rome. So at this point, we might look at some of the uh, Germanic kingdoms that end up being established in territory once belonging to the Roman Empire. So one of the earliest, uh, based uh, right in Italy, in fact, uh, inclusive of Rome, would be the Austro-Gothic Kingdom of Italy. So that started when, uh, you know, so after the Western Empire kind of disappeared, you know, there were still, you know, those in the Eastern Empire who thought maybe, you know, we could... Uh, reconquer that territory, maybe incorporate it into our empire. One of them was the Emperor Zeno in Constantinople, who sent the Ostrogoths into Italy to remove Odasser. You know, it's kind of also considered a bit of an affront, you know, that this master of the soldiers thought, uh, took it upon himself to remove an emperor. Uh, but in any event, right, the Ostrogoths go into Italy. They're led by their tribal leader, Theodoric, uh, and they're very successful. They conquer Italy. But then Theodoric is like, well, you know, why should I turn it over to the Eastern Roman Empire? Decides to establish himself as a ruler in Italy himself uh, in 493, marking the beginning of the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy. Uh, and so he's going to reign from 493 to 526, and he's somewhat successful. Uh, you know, so, you know, the question is, how do you govern this territory where you have large numbers of, you know, members of the Ostrogothic tribe, but also many Romans, right, people who consider themselves to be Romans who are living there? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you kind of cohabitate, the, you know, these two different groups, right? So first of all, Theodoric uh, had a Roman education, right? So he appreciated Roman civilization. Uh, the Roman way of doing things. And so he's going to try and create a synthesis of Ostrogothic and Roman practices, right? Like somehow, you know, the best of both worlds, if you will. Uh, and he will maintain the basic structure of Roman imperial government, uh, even if he does establish separate systems of rule for Ostrogoths and Romans. Uh, but somehow it doesn't really work. Now, he's a fairly effective ruler, so as long as he's there, he's able to kind of, you know, maintain this arrangement. Uh, but fr from an institutional point of view, he's not able to create something that can carry on without him. One major problem is uh, religious friction, right? The Ostrogoths, for whatever reason, adopted Arian Christianity, whereas most of the Romans have, had accepted the kind of more orth orthodox position uh, adopted by the Council of Nicaea. And so this is going to create a lot of friction between the two groups. Uh, and, you know, again, as long as Theodoric was there, you know, it kind of worked. But as soon as he died, things started to fall apart. Uh, but, you know, I should note that uh, in part because with his death, the Eastern Roman Empire decided to give it one more go. Kind of like, well, if you want something do, uh, done right, do it yourself. This time they will try to reconquer Italy with their own forces. And they are actually successful. They retake Italy between 535 and 552. Uh, but then aren't able to hold it. Uh, some of that reflects that their troops are hit by the plague, uh, but then also they're going to be confronted by another Germanic tribe, the Lombards, who end up moving in and conquering much of northern and central Italy. And by the way, the northern region of Italy today, known as Lombardy, taking its name from this Germanic tribe. So another tribe we might look at is the Visigothic uh, tribes that are going to end up establishing a kingdom in what today is Spain. Uh, so like the Ostrogoths in Italy, they had to find a way to coexist with the native Roman population, right? I mean, uh, Spain had been under Roman rule for centuries at this point, right? So it had been uh, heavily Romanized. Um, so, you know, some of the dynamics are a bit different, Right. Uh, one problem is the, the Visigoths are, you know, very martial, like they see themselves as kind of a warrior caste. Uh, so, you know, they tend to kind of look down on the larger native population. They will be the dominant element. Uh, one, you know, one hope is at least they, they practice the right kind of Christianity. The Visigoths adopted the uh, what, what we might at this point call uh, call Latin or Catholic. Christianity, again, reflective of what had been decided at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, also, and this was actually something not permitted in with the Ostrogoths, 
Uh, they encourage uh, intermarriage, right, between uh, the Visigoths and the local population. And this does happen to some degree, creating kind of, uh, you know, you have a fusion of the two. Uh, and eventually you're going to have kind of uh, developing from this a new political elite that is kind of a mix of what had been the senatorial elite uh, within the native Roman population uh, and the kind of warrior caste among the Visigoths, right? Uh, they had one major weakness. They had no hereditary monarchy. It meant whenever a ruler died, basically a number of individuals would fight it out. And that could be very disruptive. Having said that, maybe they would have carried on, but in 711, they're going to be confronted by a new enemy, uh, which is uh, a newly emerging Islamic civilization that very rapidly is going to create an empire inclusive of Spain, right? So Spain will fall to Muslim invaders in 711. You know, by the way, this is, just to give you an idea, the Visigothic kingdom in Spain as, at its greatest extent, uh, which would have included uh, a fair amount of territory in what today is now France, right? The, uh, the painting on the left uh, kind of reflecting their uh, kind of martial skills. I'm not sure exactly what's happening here, but I imagine it might be that the king has just died uh, and potential successors are fighting, uh, fighting for the throne. And speaking of France, uh, what will become France at, you know, at the time uh, of the collapse of the Roman Empire, this territory generally referred to as Gaul. Uh, why does it become France? Because it will become the center of the Frankish kingdom, the Franks being yet another Germanic tribe. Uh, so the Frankish kingdom will be established by Clovis, uh, who became a Catholic Christian around 500 and then very quickly converted all of his subjects. Uh, he kind of understood that this actually would be an effective way to legitimize his rule. This would help him to gain the support of the Roman Catholic Church, which increasingly is becoming a very important political institution as well as a religious one in Europe. Uh, so he converts the Frankish people, uh, and the Frankish kingdom is going to be quite large. It actually consists of not just what today is France, but a good portion of what today is West Germany. Uh, but by the way, again, the name France comes from the Frankish kingdom. So Frankish, of course, referring to the Germanic tribe that ended up settling in what would become France and from whence, uh, whence France's name comes. Uh, the actual ruling dynasty, the Merovingian dynasty, a name derived from a supposed semi-legendary ancestor named Merovich. Uh, just by you know, way of fun fact, for those of you who have seen the, uh, the Matrix films, the second and third ones feature rather prominently a French character uh, named the Merovingian, uh, clearly a reference to the founding dynasty of what would become France. In any event, uh, after the death of Clovis, and this kind of reflected the Frankish custom that when a king died, he should divide his territory between his sons, we end up with three new kingdoms, Neustria in the north, Austrasia around the Rhine, uh, Rhine River, which currently is the border between France and Germany, uh, and the kingdom of Burgundy, today a very important region in France. Um, Obviously, you know, over successive generations, this could have become a problem as each ruler then would further divide his kingdom into smaller kingdoms and you end up with uh, really a large number of very tiny kingdoms, right? So uh, that's not actually going to happen. We'll get to that momentarily. Uh, we should note that during this period, we do see, you know, kind of broader developments reflective of the entire region, the kind of emergence of a new ruling class that basically is a combining of the warrior elite of the Frankish and the old Gallo-Roman senatorial class, right, that had already been there when the Franks came in. Uh, this is going to create a new nobility, a new aristocracy, uh, these two groups intermingling, intermarrying, and so forth. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the, this Frankish kingdom isn't going to uh, keep dividing itself into nothingness. Uh, eventually, it's going to be reunited, uh, but by someone not of the ruling dynasty, a fellow named Charles Martel, who held the position of Major Domus, uh, mayor of the palace. And it was a very important position, but he is not of the, the ruling family, right? So he became Major Domus beginning in 714. Uh, and in the ensuing period, the Franks are going to be confronted by uh, 
a major threat, right? This kind of expanding Islamic empire that has moved into Spain. And, by, and so that is actually going to play a, a very major role in his rise to, to power, right? By his death in 741, he was able to bring all three Merovingian kingdoms under his rule. Uh, and uh, he was able to actually push back on this expanding Islamic empire. We'll get to that momentarily. We should note uh, that with respect to broader developments, uh, we really are starting to move into what will become feudalism. The Franks did very little to encourage commerce and trade, and by 750, uh, pretty much all of Frankish Gaul, what will become France, was largely an agricultural state centered around these large landed estates, the old Roman uh, Latifundia. Uh, and so, you know, when we think of feudalism, really we have like, you know, you have uh, these very large landed estates that are pretty much self-sufficient, very little interaction going on between them. Uh, and a lot of this does reflect kind of a diminishing of commerce and trade where, you know, if you need something, you have to produce it yourself. And that does become one of the kind of defining characteristics of uh, feudalism when we get, you know, deep into the Middle Ages. Uh, with regard to turning back this expanding Islamic empire that had uh, recently conquered Spain from the Visigoths, the decisive battle was the Battle of Poitiers in 722. Uh, and so that battle is actually, uh, why is it decisive? Because from that point forward, you really have kind of established the boundary between, on the one hand, a kind of emerging Christian European civilization, and on the other, this Islamic civilization encompassing the Middle East, North Africa, and Spain, uh, and even going as far as the borders of China uh, to the east. We're going to be looking at that more closely in a different lecture. So wrapping up our discussion of these various Germanic kingdoms that are being established during this period, we might look at developments in England. Uh, so Britain had been part of the Roman Empire, but by the 5th century, pretty much abandoned the Roman armies, withdrew. The indigenous population there, which had been heavily Romanized, uh, very often we refer to as Britons, of uh, Celtic background. Uh, but now we're going to see a number of different Germanic tribes beginning to settle in England, uh, mostly belonging to the Angles and Saxons, hence why very often we refer today uh, uh, to English people as being Anglo-Saxon, a reference to this kind of Germanic uh, element, right? And they're coming from, uh, they had already kind of settled in the northern part of Europe in parts of northern Germany and Denmark. And so now they're beginning to settle in Britain, where they establish a number of small kingdoms. The native Celtic Britons will end up being pushed back to the periphery, roughly corresponding today to the regions of Cornwall, Wales and Cumberland. And even today we see these as being Celtic people, uh, much like the Irish in Ireland and of course the Scottish in the north who were never part of the Roman Empire and are able to kind of resist this uh, uh, invasion by Angles and Saxons. And this map kind of gives you an idea of, you know, uh, initially we're going to have a large number of small kingdoms. Uh, many of which now have lent their name to various regions in England, like Northumbria, Wessex, and so forth. Uh, Wales, of course, remaining Celtic. Uh, by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, today uh, it is considered a principality in terms of its position within the United Kingdom, so it's not part of England. Uh, by the way, just in connection with this period, there are some historians who feel that many of the legends and tales associated with King Arthur might correspond to this kind of period where the Romans are withdrawing, that perhaps King Arthur corresponds to some kind of Roman commanding officer, uh, you know, who was, uh, you know, ethnically uh, a Briton. And so after the Roman armies left, perhaps uh, kind of forming a resistance to these Germanic tribes that were coming in. Uh, you know, this is ver something very difficult to prove. Uh, but I don't know, some of you might have seen there was a film about King Arthur that was kind of rooted in this particular historical interpretation of him. Uh, again, kind of corresponding to this period when the Romans are withdrawing uh, and the Romanized Britons who remained behind trying to put up a kind of resistance. So before we finish the first half of our lecture, I do want to talk about uh, some of the influence coming from these Germanic tribes in terms of the development of Europe moving uh, forward. Uh, so you, you might remember we had a reading on the influence of Roman law, and certainly many aspects of the Roman Empire are going to carry forward and have a tremendous influence on how Europe develops. If we think of Europe as kind of defining 
uh, a broader civilization inclusive of many people. But of course, there will also be Germanic influences as well. Uh, and some of these influence, uh, influences are very, very different from kind of what's coming from the Roman side, right? Particularly if we think about Roman law, right? So Germanic customary law is also going to have an impact. And uh, how the Germans thought about, you know, Ger Germanic tribes, I should say, because we're not speaking about modern day Germans, but how they thought about the law uh, is reflected in, in kind of their customary practice, very different uh, from kind of the Roman concept. Right. Uh, so first of all, if we think about government, like these kind of emerging kingdoms, you know, the fact that kingship or monarchy is going to be the defining form of government moving forward, many aspects of that really reflecting more Germanic influence than Roman. Right. But also in terms of how the law is going to be carried out. Now, eventually, Roman law is going to kind of be rediscovered when we get to what's often referred to as the High Middle Ages. But but that's going to take some time. Right. And so for much of the Middle Ages, probably Germanic customary law is going to have a much greater impact. And so, for instance, you know, under the Roman system, if you committed a crime uh, that was considered an offense against society or the state. Right. So the idea that, you know, whatever, you know, first of all, the determination of innocence or, or guilt and then whatever punishment should be applied for the crime uh, should reflect principles of justice as opposed to vengeance. Right. So kind of the idea that the state can act in a very objective and impartial manner. Uh, and, and, you know, we still have that idea. Right. If you are tried for a crime, you are prosecuted by the state, the district attorney. Right. You're not prosecuted by a private lawyer hired by the uh, the family of the victim. And, you know, of course, we have the idea that on a jury, you would never have members of the victim's family serving because they wouldn't be able to be impartial. Right. Uh, for, you know, under Germanic law, they kind of thought about this differently. Right. Uh, it tended to be tended to be more personal. Crimes were really understood as being against the victim. Right. And the victim had the right uh, to some kind of compensation. Right. So first of all, crimes often led to blood feuds. Right. There was always the danger that, you know, if you killed somebody, members of the victim's family had an obligation to exact vengeance on you. Right. Or, you know, at least on somebody related to you. And that could lead to a blood feud between different families or different tribes. Uh, so they developed this kind of mechanism to try and prevent a, a blood feud from developing. Right. Because that kind of thing can carry on over generations. So the basic idea is that every person had a particular value. And so therefore, one way to avoid a blood feud would be for the wrongdoer to pay uh, the person uh, you know, the victim or the family of the, of the victim who was wronged, a fine. And they called this fine a vergelt. Vergelt literally meaning uh, kind of the value of a person, right? It's kind of a, gelt is actually the German word for money, ver referring to kind of an individual, a human being. Uh, so kind of the idea, you know, different people had different value, right? The amount of the vergelt corresponded to the value of the person wronged in monetary terms. And certainly that would have reflected the idea that a noble was more valuable than a commoner. Uh, you know, it might also break down along uh, uh, gender lines. It might surprise you to know that uh, a young woman was considered to have a lot of value, uh, but it didn't really have to do with her person, but rather her, you know, ability to produce children, right? So if you killed the young woman of a family, uh, you know, it wasn't just that the family lost her, they lost whatever children she might have had. So her vergelt would have been pretty high. Uh, that might be compared to an older person whose vergelt, uh, the fine you'd have to pay if you had killed them or somehow harmed them, uh, would have been considerably less. You know, regarding how do you determine guilt or innocence, right? So from the Romans, we have, for instance, the idea of innocent until proven guilty, the idea that you should demonstrate guilt on the basis of evidence, right? That you should have a kind of rational, logical argument constructed around the evidence demonstrating that somebody was either innocent or guilty. Uh, German customary law, a little bit different, right? So there were two mechanisms uh, that really featured prominently. One was compurgation, right? So uh, this is kind of like having an alibi, right? Guilt was determined by compurgation, the swearing of an oath backed up by a group of oath helpers numbering between 12 and 25, uh, which is really kind of more, uh, I guess, a determination of innocence, right? That you could prove uh, because you have like, you know, a certain number of witnesses that you didn't commit the crime. You were, you know, engaged elsewhere. Or, or it could be, you know, that you have uh, 
12 to 25 uh, oath helpers who can uh, can vouch for your reliability, uh, maybe even confirm that you witnessed something that you claim you saw, right? That might be evidence of guilt. Uh, of course, this could be problematic if you think about it a bit. Uh, somebody with influence with wealth probably would have an easier time enlisting oath helpers than somebody who is poor or didn't have much influence. Uh, so from our point of view, and perhaps because we've been heavily influenced by Roman law, that doesn't sound like such a good idea, perhaps, right? Uh, the other mechanism was the ordeal. Right, based on the idea that if a person was innocent, no harm could come to them. And particularly as the Christian faith becomes more prominent, you're going to have this idea that if you're really innocent, God will not let anything harm you. So one way of demonstrating your innocence would be, for instance, to put your hand in the fire. Right, The idea that if you're innocent, God will ensure that your hand doesn't get burned. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Uh, how often did that work? Right. Uh, obviously, then, if somebody said, well, I don't want to put my hand in the fire, that might be perceived as evidence that you're guilty. Right. Because if you were innocent, you wouldn't be afraid to do so. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't know quite how that played out uh, in real life. So we'll conclude uh, the first half of this lecture by uh, saying a few things about the Germanic family. Uh, this will have some impact on, you know, developments during the Middle Ages in Europe, obviously, though, you know, eventually, uh, when we get to more modern times, we tend to focus on the nuclear family, right? The father, mother, and children. Uh, back in the day, the extended family was actually the center of social organization. Uh, men were dominant, you know, same story we've seen uh, over and over. Women expected to obey their fathers, and then after that, the husband. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, a few things that, that might be considered uh, more progressive from the standpoint of a woman's position in society. Uh, a widow could hold property without a male guardian. That isn't always the case when we look at uh, other civilizations. You know, additionally, women were valued uh, in a certain way. We already mentioned that the Vergelt of a wife of childbearing age was considerably higher than that of a man. Uh, but again, that kind of represented what, what was perceived as her ability to provide children for the family. You know, the family would benefit from that. Uh, marriages often arranged. Uh, it's going to be a long time before marriage is about romantic feelings uh, between two individuals, right? Marriage throughout much of history, really about bringing families together, right? And that is definitely going to be how it works in the Middle Ages in Europe, particularly, uh, in fact, the further up the social hierarchy you go. Uh, so, for instance, you know, among royalty, marriage really has very little to do with any kind of personal affection between individuals. It's more about forming alliances. Uh, but that, that kind of dynamic is going to play out uh, pretty much at all different uh, social levels, right? Though I mean, you know, what, it actually, uh, what, what is actually the benefit of, you know, family alliances, of course, a bit different. Uh, when uh, a marriage took place, the prospective groom made a payment to the bride's family. This kind of symbolized the idea uh, that you're purchasing uh, paternal authority over the bride, right? Instead of the father having authority over her, the husband does now. It also kind of uh, symbolizes the fact that she is now part of a new family, that of her husband. Uh, so meaning her old family has kind of lost, you know, whatever uh, productive value or childbearing value she might have had. Uh, so you have to kind of compensate them for that. Uh, and finally, the expectation, uh, expectation was that the bride should be a virgin, adultery viewed as a pollution of the woman and her offspring. This is nothing new. You know, again, adulterous women severely punished. Uh, if men engaged in sexual relations outside of marriage, not quite a big deal, right? We, we saw that going back all the way to Mesopotamian society. Uh, you know, rather unfortunate, obviously. Obviously, you know, a... Uh, Hard to justify double standard, uh, but there you go. In any event, we'll stop there. That is the end of the first half of this lecture. Uh, so do make sure to continue with part two.